Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. We have a teaching institute which is dedicated to excellence, skills, refinement, and broadening your knowledge. We run courses year-round and we'd be happy to have you as one of our graduates. Today we're going to talk about the class two. Let's take a look at this on my little sketch pad here and go over the MO on tooth number three with some of the particulars. One of the things you're going to have to remember about tooth number three is that it has the oblique ridge. And the oblique ridge is a structure which should not be crossed unless you absolutely have to. We have pits in the central fossa and on the mesial area that need to be connected. There is a groove, and it's kind of hard to see, but there is a groove that runs between the distal buckle and mesial buckle cusp that needs to be followed as well with the dovetail. And then, of course, we're going to extend the preparation towards the middle of the contact area. I'm outlining here the exit angles of a typical box, 90 degrees relative to the tooth surface, and creating a little curved axial wall. And now I'm placing the isthmus area which will be approximately one millimeter and the walls are convex relative to each other. The dovetail is going to follow the oblique ridge partially and then it'll change and move into the buccal groove area. Now we should turn our attention to the S-curve. We want to extend the S-curve from the box to the middle of the triangular ridge but it should enter slightly into the cusp itself before it makes this turn, about a tenth of a millimeter. So if we're going to outline the entire preparation, we can just take my little black pen here and I can move that around and you can see that this would be the approximate outline form for this particular tooth with this particular orientation. We have to remember that the axial pulpal should be beveled and this bevel is going to be approximately 0.3 millimeters to maybe 0.5 millimeters. We're going to break contact the buccal, lingual, and gingival at approximately 0.5 millimeters. And so let me draw in a little bit of gums here so it looks as though we've just prepped this tooth and kind of color this in here. Okay. And you can see that the curvature of the axial wall should follow the outer curvature of the tooth and that means in terms of the amount of convexity and form. So let's keep that in mind as well. If we take a look at the width of the isthmus, the isthmus width is going to be one millimeter and it's going to be convergent the other thing you have to remember is that the dovetails should be wider than the isthmus by about 50%, so just keep that in mind. The depth of the pulpal is 1.5 millimeters, but that's at the most minimum area, so you will have areas that are definitely deeper than 1.5. Clearance, 0 0.5 millimeters all the way across. You could be as little as 0.3 and be okay. And then the axial depth, or the gingival width, is going to measure 1.2 to 1.4. Uh, some schools may ask you to be a little bit deeper than this, but it'll be school dependent. Here you can see 90 degrees internal and 90 degrees external line angles and convergent occlusal walls. The distal area, the dovetail, does not need to be divergent because you're adjacent to the oblique ridge, which is a very formidable structure it doesn't need to have the care given to it that you would give to a marginal ridge, for example. So let's get to the prep we're going to do with some planning. And I'd like to just spend a minute counting the teeth, making sure I'm on the right tooth. We have situations all the time where we hear that our students have prepared the tooth uh, incorrectly by moving onto another tooth, for example, or by doing the wrong surface. So let's make sure that we're always on the right tooth. I'm just identifying that central pit area, that mesial pit area. The oblique ridge. 
you're getting kind of an idea of what this prep is going to look like. Uh, you may not be able to use a pencil on any of the tests you'll be taking, and you certainly wouldn't do this in the patient's mouth routinely, but you could do this in your practice and get a really good idea of what the outline form is going to ultimately look like. So I'm just making some sketches here with the pencil, getting an idea where I'm going to move the burr, uh, visualizing the outline form before I even start. And I think that that is a very important step. The 0.5 millimeter pencil, if you are allowed to use it, is pretty good because you can use it as a measuring device as well. Uh, and you can see how much clearance you're going to want to have with the adjacent teeth. And I would say that that would be probably uh, the optimal amount of clearance. Um, I tend to be a little bit less than that on most of my preps. I tend to be closer to 0.3. So your overall uh, outline would look something like this with uh, 90 degree exit angles. Fairly straight lingual wall of the occlusal uh, paralleling the oblique ridge with your dovetail for part of it and then wrapping around onto the facial moving towards the facial on the other part of it. So let's start with uh, preparation and we're going to utilize the punch cut with a 330 burr and we're going to find that this is best accomplished by doing the punch cut in the mesial area where you're going to be dropping a box anyway. So we don't want to start the punch cut in the central fossa and inadvertently overextend into the oblique ridge. We'd rather, uh, I like to say, sneak up on that area. So I think in general if you were to start your punch cuts near your box that would be a really good idea. So here's the initial punch cut and it's not so close to the box in this case because of the morphology of this tooth having the mesial pit so far away. But you can see that the burr is being held perpendicular to the occlusal table and we're not going to have the burr tipped uh, off to the facial or off to the lingual uh, we're going to try to follow that. So the punch cut is now needs to be extended and we're going to extend it into the central pit. So we're going to use the same burr, 330. We're going to move it distally right into that central pit area. And we're going to maintain the depth of the burr at 1.5 throughout this entire process. We're not going to uh, bring the burr up or down, we're going to try to keep it nice and level throughout. So you can see that this is an odd little shape, but it is exactly what the tooth is asking you to do, and that's what this is all about. It's about following the tooth's morphological requirements. The dovetail is quite simple. It's just a, an extension off towards the facial. The prep is very conservative at this point, only 0.8 millimeters wide, so we can probably extend uh, the dovetail area almost the full thickness of the burr and still be about right. Uh, we're going to ultimately widen that occlusal isthmus just a little bit when we smooth everything, but we're just getting an idea where things are supposed to go. Now we turn our attention to the proximal extension. Uh, this is the third step. Uh, fourth step actually. We did the punch cut, we extended into the central pit, we went to the buccal groove, and now we're going to extend off towards the mesial with the burr and go right to the middle of the contact area. And that may or may not be in a straight line. You may end up meandering off in one direction or another in order to get the burr right into the middle of the contact area. So don't let that alarm you. This is kind of the way it is and we're trying to think about these steps as uh, being driven by a couple of things. The morphology, the environment that the tooth is in, in other words the adjacent tooth contact, and then of course the requirements for the amalgam which dictate uh, certain measurements. So once again 330 burr we're just verifying that the depth is in fact 1.5 at the shallowest areas. And, um, you, you know, you can see that the burr is definitely deeper in, in other areas. And that's completely acceptable. This is what the amalgam should be like when it's completed. Most uh, operators that I see uh, prepare their amalgams far too shallow. 
So let's now start with the proximal slot. And for this, we're going to utilize the 245 burr. And this is a longer burr. It's a burr that is 3 millimeters in length. It's got the same width, and it's got a slightly flat bottom to it. And we're going to utilize this to create a slot that will be the start of the proximal box. And you can kind of estimate how far the burr will extend by looking from the side and seeing that, oh yeah, I'm going to have to put the burr about that far down before I really am able to break gingival contact. That's our objective. Now we don't always break gingival contact with the burr and I don't want you to feel that you need to break it with the burr. I want you to get close though. So hold the burr on its side and see how far down it needs to go in order to get close to breaking the contact and always leave that little shell. That shell is your friend. That is what's going to keep you from damaging the adjacent tooth and this is one of the most important aspects of any examination is that the adjacent tooth has been untouched by our procedure. You notice we're leaning the burr to create a convergent wall on the lingual and a perpendicular wall on the facial. And this is uh, probably a little bit of a new concept for some of you, you where you've tried to keep things convergent on both walls. But if you look at this diagram I've put together and we're looking at the maxillary mandibular molars from the mesial view, you can see that there's acute angles being formed on the proximal walls that are contained within the functional cusp and the non-functional cusp walls are making 90 degree angles relative to the gingival. And this is a subtle thing, but it's, I would consider this to be advanced operative dentistry. And this is something that we're definitely trying to do when we drop this box. We're trying to lean the burr towards the facial when we're going up against the lingual proximal wall and we're trying to keep the burr perpendicular to the gingival when we are preparing the facial wall. Not always easy to do, but something we're trying to do. I don't believe that any examiners are going to be specifically looking for this aspect of your prep, but I can tell you that if you obey these principles, your prep will typically end up scoring higher. So here we are dropping this little slot in approximately and we're just working our way down more gingival. And there's really no fear of hitting tooth number four. The biggest fear people have at this point are usually twofold, either uh, extending too far into the axial wall, which I don't think that that's gonna be an issue at all, or the other fear is that they punch through the gingival and they, their burr just slips right through. And I know that Everyone has experienced that horrible feeling when the bird just slips through and, and punches down through that gingival. So my recommendations are really simple. Finger rest and new burr. Don't use an old burr where you have to push hard. Keep that burr nice and sharp. Throw it away when it's used. And I think if you can see that your shell is your friend, it's protecting you, and you're in no way worried about going too deep axially, because by the time we're done, this opening at the top is going to be about 1.5 millimeters wide mesial distally, and the burr is only 0.8. So you've got a lot of wiggle room here, especially if you're able to keep the burr close to tooth number four. Uh, in other words, if you're able to keep that shell very narrow. So we get to the point where we're pretty confident that it's just about ready to break away at the gingival. And... Uh, we, we turn our attention to the, the need to use hand instruments, and I think hand instruments are uh, essential for all of our Class two preparations. So let's take a look at a few of them here. Uh, this is a real basic set. There are many, many more than this, but these uh, four instruments uh, can usually get the job done very nicely for you. I have a couple others that I like to use at times, but this is the 10714 enamel hatchet. And this is uh, probably the most universally used instrument in, in dentistry, hand instrument. Uh, we also have the marginal trimmers, gingival margin trimmers. This is the mesial. You can tell because the, the angulation of the tip is, is facing towards the gingival and away from the axial wall. And here is the distal gingival margin trimmer where the angle is facing away from the axial wall distally. And this is the bin angle chisel. And bin angle chisels are 
are, are sometimes one millimeter, but oftentimes the bend angle chisels are 1.5 and they're a little bit bulkier and harder to use. And we're going to go over how to use the bend angle chisel in the rest of this video. The enamel hatchet, a uh, wonderful instrument, one millimeter wide. It's got a seven millimeter long blade and it has a flat side and it has a side where you have the bevel that you can see. On the Gentle Martin trimmer you have a, a curved instrument. It's longer. It has an angle at the end of it and we're going to be cutting with the instrument with the flat side like right here. This is the distal. And then we're going to look at the bin angle chisel which is like a Wheedlestad chisel but has these bends in it so that it allows you to gain access to the box more readily and it has the bevel facing in different directions and so uh, we're going to go through how to go forward with all of these uh, instruments when we get further into the proximal box. At this point I think that you could probably deepen the axial wall a little bit more because uh, it may not be so easy to get an instrument in that box on the lingual side. Uh, I'm showing you with an enamel hatchet right now but I'm going to switch over to the bin angle chisel and feature this instrument as uh, one that could be used to refine the proximal box. And we're just tipping the instrument away from the axial and cracking away this little shell. And while we crack away that little shell, we've just gained clearance. And we've gained clearance at the gingival, at the lingual, and at the facial. And even though there's a little piece of tooth still stuck in there, we can just use the bin angle chisel to kind of wiggle it out of there and uh, kind of rotate the instrument a little bit clockwise and counterclockwise as we insert it to uh, break off these little lips of tooth structure adjacent to tooth number four. And you notice that we're able to do this without creating a single scratch on tooth number four. And at this point, if you were to try to use a bin angle chisel in this area, you would hit number four. Uh, not so much on the facial this way, but on the lingual side you definitely would hit number four. So what's uh, recommended is that you use the instrument sideways like this to chop away the axial to gain a little bit more room. Now you could certainly do this with the burr and I think that that would probably be uh, equally if not more effective than using the hand instrument, but the hand instrument can be used really nicely by uh, kind of tipping it towards the corners and, and creating this convexity that we oftentimes find so difficult to achieve. So because the box is conservative, uh, we're going to stay with the enamel hatchet and just push. And you notice how we just go crunch right down there uh, on the lingual and push towards the gingival with a good finger rest. Uh, we're really holding the instrument really steady and we're using the primary cutting edge. We can also use a secondary cutting edge, which we can see here in this uh, photograph, to perform some really nice alterations to the axial wall. You can use it here to scrape up against the axial wall. And a, a lot of uh, operators don't really use this instrument that way, and it's unfortunate because it's a great indication for uh, this instrument to create this axial curvature that we have always found so difficult to achieve. Whenever you are using the hatchet to uh, break away this little lip of undermined tooth structure at the exit angle, you want to maintain that 90 degrees. And uh, I always tell the students to maintain the 90 no matter how conservative you are or how aggressive you are. You always want to have that 90 degree exit angle occurring at all times and then when you get to the perfect extension, you know you're going to be um, at the right angle. If you need to move the, the wall more facially, and in this case we do, we want to do this technique called undermine and chip, where we move the 245 towards the facial, towards the lingual, towards the gingival even, and then leave undermine areas and then just use the hand instruments to chip them away. And it works incredibly well. It's a very effective technique for gaining more clearance. When you're ready to do the S-curve, 
you want to basically just smooth off that sharp edge there and smooth anything that is angular. So you're maintaining the same depth, you're holding the handpiece such that the burr is perpendicular to the occlusal table, and you're probably using the burr at about one-tenth the full speed of the burr. So it's a very delicate maneuver. Uh, you're, you're cutting and checking, cutting and checking. Look at how many times I'm going back and forth and checking what I'm doing here to make sure that I have this nice gradual transition in the S. The S uh, is uh, called an S curve and not a Z curve. And what I mean by that is it should be smooth and flowing. Uh, this fluidity that we are trying to achieve with the class two uh, can best be gained utilizing the 330 burr and smoothing the walls while we're maintaining the proper depth and the proper convergence. So the the depth of the axial is really not enough and um, my placement of the S-curve was slightly premature. I would have recommended that this axial wall be made a little bit deeper and the extensions a little bit further before you do the S-curve, but I picked up the handpiece and thought, oh, let's just show the S-curve at this stage of the game. But ultimately, um, the S-curve would be done a little bit later. The GMT can be used to gain a little bit more gingival clearance, and we're just using it from the middle and rotating it over towards the lingual. In the middle, rotate it towards the facial this way, and it's incredibly efficient instrument, particularly if it's brand new and sharp. And that's the only way we like to use instruments is when they are really, really sharp. They're very uh, effective this way. You know, there's a, chefs will often say, you don't cut yourself on a sharp knife, you cut yourself on a dull knife. And I think that that is really an indication of the fact that we just don't have enough control if the blade is dull. The bin angle chisel can be used to just get a little bit more depth that we were looking for and um, and then we are going to need to reestablish that S-curve a little bit. But it's it's kind of good to see me work through this process because it's, um, it's real world here. You know, I'm struggling with the preparation just like anyone would and making estimations of where things should be and then finding out that no that's not quite right on on uh, further analysis and needs to be altered a little bit more and I think that that concept that we make errors we recognize them and then have to correct them is a really good one to to think about uh, it uh, it's kind of comforting to know that we all make mistakes and it's the excellent operator that takes the extra effort to correct the mistakes you can see that the, the prep is looking decent. It's not quite uh, achieved the final form that it's going to have. I have uh, some changes to make. I am going to get a little bit more facial extension, a little bit more lingual extension, and I'm going to sharpen up those uh, internal line angles. I'm going to create the axial pulpal bevel, and that's where this GMT is so effective at. Um, and I like gingival bevels too. I like a very long uh, or wide gingival bevel, probably about two-thirds of the width of the gingival should be a very minor 20 degree bevel declination towards the gingival. And uh, I like that. I like using the same instrument to um, create even sharp internal line angles at the axial uh, proximal line angles. The axial pulpal bevel is something that is uh, absolutely required and every examiner will be looking for this and making sure that the axial wall is divergent occlusally, uh, convergent buccolingually, and has a bevel on it. So take a look around and clean things up and, and you know, make an assessment. Are we looking pretty good? We are. I mean, I think if, at this point, if you were to turn this in as your final project, you would, you would do quite well. But we are going to kick it up uh, a notch by removing a few little rough spots. And we're also going to uh, extend a little bit more facially so that it's closer to that 0.5 that we were looking for. You notice that little ledge there that's created sometimes when you're during the S curve and um, you can go back in with a hatchet and just smooth that off that little gouge that you created 
when the S curve was placed and it works uh, pretty well. This entire preparation from start to finish doesn't take longer than about 15-20 minutes uh, to get it to this point to perform the refinement which is our next step you're probably going to spend another 10 minutes so I think if you gave yourself on an examination one hour you would have more than enough time and here's the final prep as I've uh, played with it for a little bit maybe another five to ten minutes uh, showing you the gingival bevel uh, 20 degrees uh, sloping downward you see the axopulpal bevel you can see the sharp line angles uh, the depth looks good nice dovetail good retention even the bin angle chisel could even be used to to create a gingival bevel, uh, the axopulpal bevel if you if you wanted to so uh, a lot of different ways to achieve the results that we're looking for in this particular case. I don't like S-curves that are located within the box and you can see that uh, the S-curve uh, starts right at the box and curves back over to the occlusal. Uh, the width of the isthmus is less than 1.5. The dovetail is a little bit over 1.5. So this is looking pretty good. Uh, you can even use, the, use this as a measuring tool to see that the the axial depth is about 1.2, 1.25. So we're pretty happy with this particular preparation. I think that this would be considered a successful uh, attempt. Uh, there's no adjacent tooth damage. The, the prep has retention. It doesn't have any undermined uh, enamel. It's smooth and flowing. Slightly rounded internal line angles. Convergent where it's supposed to be. And uh, I think that it is going to uh, satisfy all of the requirements for an amalgam. So I want to thank you for listening to this short video. I hope you found it informative and come visit me anytime.